Hello everyone and welcome to the One Stop Co-op Shop. This is Colin and today I've got a real treat for you. So I told myself over and over again I was never going to play Eldritch Horror because I really disliked Arkham Horror a lot. I didn't enjoy sitting around doing nothing for turns. I felt like I had no direction. Well, I was finally convinced. I found someone to trade the game for, uh, trade for the game. And yep, I love it. <laughs> this has got to be one of my top 10 solo games, you guys. It is fun. Uh, I, I've played it now four times already, and I'm really excited to show you guys a playthrough. Uh, I'm not going to do my normal setup video because this has been... There's so many videos out on how to set the game up. I'm actually... If this is the first time you've heard of this game, I will put in the description below a link to the best video I've seen. It's only 16 minutes long and it fully explains how to play the base game of Eldritch Horror. Totally recommend it. That's all you really need to do. <laughs> uh, here, I'm going to show you how to play the game and I really want to have a journey with you guys. So currently, you guys, I'm only playing with the base game. I have the Under the Pyramids expansion. That's why I've got this second board over here. And then I do have the Forsaken Lore expansion, but that's it. That's all I'm playing with. That's all I own. I am going to be playing with four investigators, and we'll look at them at the beginning of each of their turns. And I am going against Abhoth. I think that's how you say it. That is the ancient one we're going to go against. And I am going to play it with a specific prelude card. So let's go ahead and look at that first. Prelude cards allow you to set up the game a little bit differently each time you play the game. So we're going to do under the pyramid so that way we can have the pyramid expansion and use that extra board because that's kind of what I wanted to do. Under the pyramids. Bruised, dehydrated, and short of breath, you lean against the limestone pillar, gasping for air. Behind you, a black pit in the sand reveals the entrance to some lost passage beneath the pyramid. Your skin is raw and bloodied where the ropes chafed you. By luck, you escaped, but soon your captors will notice your absence. The roar of some profane creature echoes, echoes forth from the pit, and you fear that your presence here has not gone unnoticed. So during the fifth part of setup, um, when you're determining the Ancient One, you want to set up the Egypt sideboards. We already did that. After resolving setup, if Nefren Ka is the Ancient One, he's not, so we're not going to worry about that. If Nefren Ka is not the Ancient One, set aside all of the Museum Heist Adventures, then draw the Framed for Theft Adventure. What this adventure does is just give us another way that we can progress a story. It's not going to determine if we win or lose, but it will allow us to, to do different things. We can follow that story along as well, which is kind of fun. We have Museum Heist 1. The talisman of Wajet, an amulet meant to protect the pharaohs in the afterlife, has been stolen. The police suspect a man named Eric Weiss, but your gut tells you he is innocent. When this card enters play, place an adventure token on Cairo. When this adventure is completed, the active investigator gains Eric Weiss' unique asset, then you draw a random Museum Heist 2 adventure. As an encounter, an investigator on Cairo may attempt to convince the police that Eric has been framed, and you do an influence test. You'll see how tests work a lot in this game, because that's basically all that you do. <laughs> uh, so I'm not going to explain that here. You'll see it as we play. If you pass, the police release Eric into his custody under the condition that the, um, Eric Weiss helps apprehend the thief, and then we complete this adventure. And then we go to a random museum heist 2 card. So I have the Egypt sideboard way over here. We have our adventure token here in Cairo. So if ever we have our encounter phase in Cairo, instead of drawing a regular Cairo encounter, which is one of these uh, reddish cards, we can instead go ahead and try and do the encounter where we pass the influence test. If we do that, then we find Eric Weiss and we move that story along. Now, if you've only played the base game of Eldritch Horror, or only the small expansions, not a big one, what this does is there's different locations that this board's connected to and allows you to move on to this board, just giving you some more spaces. There is something unique here. There's, they're called local paths. You're going to see them as these dotted green lines. You actually, on your turn, you can move one space on a local path, and that does not take an action, just so you guys know. There are still, though, some ship ones as well as uncharted um, paths as well. And then what you'll see is I've put on the board these actually Lord of the Rings tokens, because, you know, I love Lord of the Rings, to help me denote which of the spaces are connected to this board. And just so you can see that, we've got the Heart of Africa over here, Spot 10 over here, the Pyramids, and Spot 17 here. 
So here we have our ancient one we're going against. We're going to set our doom track to 14. If ever that goes down to zero, then Abbott is going to awaken. We're going to flip this card. And then we're not only going to have to complete the three mysteries like normal, we're also going to have to complete the fourth one that's on the back of his card. And usually those are pretty hard. Abbott lies deep within the heart of Mount Vumernethreth. There, from the cesspit of Yuqua, it sends forth its revolting children, extending its reach across the earth. We see over here for setup, you need to set aside eight cultists. So we've got our eight cultists over here and all of the special encounter cards. I'll show you those in a second. This just denotes how we set up our mythos deck. You're going to see we're going to have two rumor cards. Rumor cards are the worst. And just so you guys know, I know that there's regular, easy, and hard mythos cards. I randomly chose, so I have no idea. Could have all hard, all easy, a combination of them. <laughs> Here we have Abbas, two different types of special encounter cards. Now, when I first played this, I was like, wait, wh what are the deep cavern cards? Well, there's a different picture down here, so make sure to, to separate out the two decks, okay? This is our clue deck. Whenever we encounter a clue, we're going to be drawing from here. And here we have our mystery deck. So we have six mystery cards. We only have to solve three of them. We'll go ahead and flip the top one, and we have exploring the caverns. The caverns twist and turn into the depths, gray ooze dripping down the rocky walls. Screams of those taken by the children echo endlessly through the dark tunnels, but there is no help to be had. When this card enters play, place one Eldritch token on each of the following wilderness spaces, 4, 10, 19, and 21. As an encounter, an investigator on a space containing an Eldritch token may spend one clue to explore the caverns beneath the Earth's surface. If he spends the clue, he draws and resolves a deep cavern specialty encounter. At the end of the Mythos phase, if there's Eldritch tokens on this card equal to half of the investigators, so that's going to be two for us, then we get to solve this first mystery. So that's what our goal is in order to win the game. Spaces 4 and 10 are here and here, and 19 and 21 are right there and way up over there. Okay, so we need to at least have encounter two of those, but we first need to collect some clues. So when you start off the game, you're going to look at the reference card based upon the number of players. Here we have our reference card. So we're playing with four investigators. We start with one gate. We start with two clues spawned out. And whenever there's a monster surge, we will put two monsters in those locations. And you'll see how monster surges work during the mythos phase. Our spawned gate is over here in San Francisco. It is green. We also have a ghoul enemy because whenever you spawn uh, or open a gate, you're automatically going to spawn one of the monsters from the monster's cup. Okay. We also have a clue over here in this city and a clue. Where's the other one? Oh, yeah. Right where Trish is standing. So that's awesome. With that, we have set up the game. I think we're ready to begin. So let's go ahead and look at our, uh, our investigators as we start the game. Elder Chor is played in a total of three different phases. The first phase is the action phase. These are all the different actions that we can take, plus I'm adding one additional called a focus action. That's in some of the other expansions that I don't have, but everyone says the game's better with it, and I tend to agree. A focus token, you can just spend an action to get a focus token, and you can use it to reroll one die. Nice. The max you can have of them is two just like the max of the ship or the railway tickets is too. So you, it's easy to uh, keep track of. So we can travel. We can travel by moving one space. And then if we have any tickets, we can use them to move additional spaces. You'll see how that works. We can prepare, which means gain one travel ticket. The only thing that's important to know about that is two things, actually. One, you have to be in a city space. And two, that city space has to be connected to that type of uh, road if you're going to get that ticket. So if I'm going to get a ship ticket, I need to be connected to, or that city that I'm in has to have a ship route out of it. Otherwise, where would I be getting the ship ticket? <laughs> uh, you can also acquire assets. That's when you're going to test your influence and try and get uh, certain assets from the reserve. You can rest. You can only do that, though, in spaces without monsters. You can trade. If you're in the same uh, space, you can trade all different types of items, clues, uh, assets, any of that stuff. What you can't trade is your health. <laughs> Sometimes I wish you could do that. Uh, and then finally, you can just do a component action. And what's different about the component action compared to all these other ones, you can only ever do each one one time. But with a component action, you can actually do different component actions, which is, which is totally fine. 
Here we have our lead investigator, Norman Withers. So Norman has a total of five physical health and seven sanity. We could, as an action, because on his card he has an action, it states I can spend two clues to discard one monster on a space containing a gate. Also, I always have the ability that once per round, you may spend one sanity in place of spending a clue. So I can use my sanity as a clue, because <laughs> I'm kind of a nut job. Uh, I start off with Feed the Mind. This is a ritual. I can take an action on it where I test my lore, which is three, but it says lore minus one, so it's actually only two. I'll take two D6 dice, roll them, try and get a five or a six. If you pass, choose an investigator on your space to improve one skill of their choice. Then we have to flip this card. So I feel like, why not? We might as well do Feed the Mind first. Let's go ahead and test our lore. Minus one. We're rolling two dice. We're looking for fives or sixes for successes. And we failed. So what we're going to do is we have a total of seven sanity. One of the things that you can do when you have clues is you can spend a clue to re-roll. So we're going to go ahead and spend a sanity to re-roll. But it's only re-rolling one die. Come on, come on, come on. There it is. That's a success. You can see how re-rolls can be super helpful in this game. <laughs> So we get to improve one of our skills. That would be lore, influence, observation, strength, or will. I'm going to go ahead and, incre and increase our lore just because that's going to allow us to be able to do this feed the mind spell even more often. But we're going to see if it's actually a good thing to do it more often because now we have to flip this card. And on the back of it might be something bad. It says resolve the effect based on your test result. So I got one success. A wealth of knowledge overwhelms your mind. The chosen investigator loses one sanity. <laughs> so I just lost two total sanity for that. I don't know if it's worth it. But at least we know what's going to happen now whenever I do this and I get one success. If I get two, your previous training suddenly becomes clear to you. No additional effect. Yeah, so now it's actually good I increased my lore because if I can get two successes, this actually won't even hurt us really. But yeah, so we've already lost two sanity. We're down to five. For our second action, I think instead of moving, because I kind of like where I am, this is Arkham. And if we do an encounter here, we could gain an incantation spell. That would be cool. I mean, it's not guaranteed, but that's most likely what will happen when we draw our, our encounter card during the encounter phase. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to gain a ship ticket because these are ship uh, uh, routes. So there's one connected there. I'm going to gain a ship ticket. So next round, I can move two spaces instead of one. So that ends the action phase for Norman. Let's now move to Mandy. Mandy here also has pretty good lore, terrible strength, not the greatest will, but very observant of four. Uh, she has an action that you can draw two clues from the cool pool and then spawn one of them and discard the other. Also, after resolving a research encounter, that's those encounters where there's the clue tokens that you're trying, we're trying to get so that we can do the, uh, you know, complete and defeat the abbots, solve those, solve those mysteries. After she does that, if she gains exactly one clue from that encounter, she actually gets to gain two. That's cool. She has the same health and sanity as Norman. She has two items, a magnifying glass, which states once per round, you or another investigator on your space may spend one clue to reroll um, all or any number of dice instead of just one and then she also has know thy enemy this is a unique asset and it states whenever you gain a clue during a research encounter place one eldritch token on this card and then you can flip it if you want you don't have to so i always feel like it's good to get more clues out on the table so i think the first thing i'm going to do with her is i'm going to do an action of drawing two clues and i can spawn one so these are our clues we get to look at the back side and then they tell you where they're going to be placed and you get to decide which one with her ability i can decide which one i want to spawn and i will put it in that location so either the sahara desert or cairo here's the thing cairo we need to go to anyways because of our adventure so i'm going to go ahead and place cairo's clue out on the board that's on that sideboard and i'll discard this one you can see there we have cairo right up there now here's the thing, you can see this is list location 17, I have a Lord of the Rings token there. That is actually connected to Cairo, but it's a ship connection. So what I think I'm gonna do for my second action is I'm gonna get a ship ticket. I can do that because there's a ship route connected. And the next time, what I can do is I can take the railroad to here and then spend a ship ticket to go right to Cairo, which is great. 
And over here in Shanghai, hopefully I can improve my lore, which would be great. So I'll grab another ship ticket. And don't forget, you can only ever have two of these. Next, we have my man, Leo. So Leo has the action that we can test our influence, which is pretty terrible. It's only two. But if we succeed, we can gain one ally asset of our choice from the reserve or discard pile. I haven't even shown you guys the reserve yet. That's one of the things that we could be doing. We could be shopping for those when we're in the city. I haven't done that yet. <laughs> uh, also, though, his inherit ability is if you're on a wilderness space, investigators on your space roll one additional die when uh, making tests. So that includes him because it says investigators. and It doesn't say other investigators. So he's really good in the wilds. He does have a hired muscled ally, which gives him plus one to his strength. So his strength is actually four. And then he can reroll one die when he makes a test using strength. <laughs> cool. So I feel like with Leo, we have a clue that's right by him. So I think I'm going to try and do this influence test first, see if we can get an ally, and then we'll go ahead and move in to where the um, clue is. Just so you guys can see, this is our reserve. Way over here on the side that I'm not showing you is the bank loan. I'll show you that when we do this. The bank loan's terrible, but usually I have to use it. <laughs> the bank loan, you can take a debt to get two successes and then use those successes to help you buy stuff from the reserve. But then usually that comes to bite you, comes back to bite you. So if he succeeds at this, he could get one of these two allies, either the um, psychoanal psychoanalyst, psychoanalyst, thank you, or the personal assistant. But the personal assistant gained plus one of his influence. He could get better at this. So that's what I'm hoping. Successes are always fives and sixes in this game. And we rolled two sixes. Sweet. That definitely means we're going to get the personal assistant. So now we'll have plus one to our influence as well. And we can reroll one die when resolving one of those influence tests. We're then going to go ahead and draw a new card. And this is what we have, police assistance. Leo's second action will be to come over here to this city space so he can encounter that clue. Because then we can get over here and get our first Eldritch token. Last but certainly not least, we have Trish. She's one of my favorites. Her action is if you do not have any clues, gain one clue. Yeah, we're going to do that right now. It's amazing to have clues. Those re-rolls, you need them for resolving your mysteries. She is awesome. <laughs> if I lose her, yeah. Oh, by the way, seven health and five uh, sanity for her. If an investigator on your space spends a clue to reroll a die, they may reroll up to two dice instead. So a lot of rerolls, you guys can tell, I'm trying to mitigate the dice as much as possible. <laughs> so I've already done her first action. Now, she is in a space where there is already a clue. So I do not want to move. I want to check out that clue. I am connected to a lot of railroad place, uh, railroad locations, so I could get a railroad ticket. But you know what? I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually do a focus for my second action. So what that means is, oh, or I could do an influence test. Is there something out there that I'd want? Oh, uh, what the hey. For now, we're just going to grab the focus token. Yes, that's also from Lord of the Rings because I don't technically have the tokens because I don't have that expansion. But we're going to play with it. And remember, that allows us to get one reroll of a single die. And the most we can have of those is two. We have now completed the action phase. We'll move to the encounter phase. Each investigator must encounter his space. You can either do a location encounter if that's the location that you're at or a token encounter if there's a token at your space. So for Leo, he's got a clue there so he can do a, a, a research uh, encounter. We're going to start with Norman. Norman's going to go ahead and do an encounter in Arkham. Now he can either choose a general encounter, which you just draw from the general deck, or he'll draw from the green deck and look at the Arkham specific card because, he, or the Arkham specific spot on that card because he's in that location. And we're definitely going to do that because we're hoping to maybe gain a spell. You try to gain access to an experiment at the university science building. We're going to have to test our influence minus one. Well, our influence is one, you guys. You can never roll less than one die, so we'll still get to roll one. If you pass, the experiment provides you knowledge of worlds beyond. Gain a plumb the void spell. Ooh. If you fail, you sneak in but get caught in the experiment. Gain a lost in time space condition. Oh, man. Okay, Norm, don't get lost in time and space. <laughs> I rolled a one. Well, it's a good thing we have sanity, and we can use sanity as a clue. 
to reroll. Let's use it. I really don't want to get lost in time and space. Uh, <laughs> no, he's lost. So I'm only going to show you guys this once. I don't want to waste your time. I'm doing this normally. But how you determine your spells and your conditions is you're actually going to take the, the stack of those cards and draw from the bottom of the deck until you find the one that you need. So I need the lost time and space. Uh, because each one has a different back. And so this way you don't get to see what it is. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to shuffle this. Going forward, I'll just show you the one that I randomly pick. So that way we don't waste time. This says here, lost in time and space. Restriction. Remove your investigator token from the game board. You are unaffected by other game effects and cannot move or perform actions. Instead of resolving an encounter, flip this card. So we basically just lost a turn. Uh, this is one thing that I don't like about this game. I mean, when I'm playing solo, it really doesn't matter. But if I was playing with four players and I totally lose my turn... Ugh. Anyways, I do believe he has to move the uh, lead investigator because he's not even on the board. So we'll give that to Mandy now. Mandy's in Shanghai, so we'll draw a purple card to see if we can improve our lore. A Taoist wizard gives you Liao, a drug that can project your mind through time if your spirit is strong. We're going to be testing our will of two. <laughs> At least that's better than one. Uh, if you pass, you uncover the location of an ancient text. Game one tome, unique asset. If you fail, your mind breaks game one madness condition. We're looking for fives and sixes. Please, there's one. Yes, so we get a tome asset. The unique asset we found is the cryptic text. We can do an action and attempt to decipher a cryptic message in this text. We can use our lore, which is three. Uh, if you pass, you uncover secrets that could alter the fate of humanity. Flip this card. Ooh, I love these cards, you guys. I really want to look at the back. <laughs> Leo's over here by a clue. We'll go ahead and resolve our first research encounter. Leo is in a city, so that's why we're reading the city portion. Too bad we're not in the wilderness. <laughs> uh, someone is petitioning the constabulary to find a missing girl, but the police are little help. Together, the two of you search for the girl. So we're using our observation minus one. Our observation is three minus one is two. If you pass, you find uh, her wandering in the sewers with no memory. Gain this clue and one random ally asset from the deck. If you fail, advance doom by one. Oh, that's that's tough. Two dice again. I love when I roll more than two dice, you guys. <laughs> I have no way to re-roll, so it is what it is. And I roll a five. Yes. Oh, man, you guys, I found a treasure hunter. Gain plus one of our observation and plus one strength. Well, we already had a plus one strength, and you can't add those together. If one was a plus two, you could take the plus two instead of the plus one. So that doesn't really help. But you may re-roll one die when resolving either an observation or a strength test, and those do add up. So we can re-roll two times when we're doing a strength test. We're going to be pretty powerful when we're fighting. And we also gained this clue, which is awesome. There's a gate by us that we could do, and there's also Eldritch tokens out that we need to do. Last but certainly not least, we have Trish over here. She also has a clue in her space, so let's go ahead and draw a research encounter reading the city portion. The note slipped under your door is written in code, but you think you can decipher it. Observation, which for her is four. That's awesome. If you pass, it warns you of impending danger and you check out early. Gain this clue. If you fail, a foul-smelling street urchin breaks into your room and attacks you during the night. Lose two health. I'm feeling pretty good, you guys. I get to roll four dice here. Let's see what we get. And we get a six with two ones and a two. <laughs> but that one six works. Trish now has two clues. She, if she can get to where an Eldritch token is, oh, we can start getting rid of those going into some deep caverns. Okay, everyone has completed their encounter phase. Let's move to the Mythos phase. Ah, oh, the Mythos deck. What a terrible deck. <laughs> We'll flip our first one. Okay, the first thing we need to do is resolve these three items in order. So the first thing we need to do is move the Omen Tracker one space to the right. The Omen Tracker starts here on the green space, and we move it here to the blue space. Now we look at all of the open gates that are out on the board, and if there are any that match this symbol, we push Doom towards zero that amount of spaces. Now we only have one gate open, and that gate is San Francisco, and it has the green symbol, so we're actually okay. That will not hit our doom at all. 
Next, we have a monster spawn symbol. So what we have to do is we have to resolve a monster surge on each space containing a gate that corresponds to the current omen. There aren't any blue ones out though, so because of that, we're going to have to reveal a new gate and then spawn a monster there. So our new gate is Tokyo, okay, and that has the blue symbol, interesting enough. And we're going to have to grab a monster from this. Let's grab this one. Okay, so we have the Clethonian. Oh, from my playthrough of Arkham Final Hour, I know that's bad. Oh, yeah, four health. Uh, the reason I'm looking on the back is because this green symbol denotes you need to look on the back of the, of the actual monster. And it says, when this monster is spawned, move it to the heart of Africa. So I'm actually not going to put this in Tokyo. I'm going to put it in the heart of Africa. Okay, and then the final piece we're going to do is place out clues. And that also is going to be two clues based upon our icon reference. So we grab two clues. And we're going to put one in space one, way up on the upper left-hand side of the board, and one in Alexandria, while well, there's a bunch over in Egypt. You compared the picture in the magazine to the drawing on the old tattered map. It was definitely a match, but what could be valuable that it required so much secrecy, and why was the particular point on the map marked with blood? <laughs> Heart of Corruption. The lead investigator gains one artifact, then rolls one die. On a one or two, he loses two health and two sanity. So this couldn't be Norman anymore. This is Mandy. So Mandy will gain a, is it a random? Yeah, it just gains one artifact, so that'll be random. And then we'll roll a die. We found the elixir of life. This is an action that we can take. Test your will, which of course Mandy's is too. <laughs> if you pass, you may spend one sanity to recover all health and discard all illness, injury, and madness conditions. Oh, that's kind of cool. But now we got to roll a die and see if she takes damage and sanity damage. And I do also want to mention that if this deck runs out, we also lose the game because we took too long trying to defeat Abhoth. Even if he's not on the board or we've solved two out of the three mysteries, doesn't matter. This is where we're totally okay with a three or a four. We just don't want a one or a two. Oh, we have a two. That means we lost two health and two sanity. So we only have three health left and five sanity. We're actually doing okay. That's all right. And that, you guys, was round one of Eldritch Horror. Yes, with four characters, it can definitely be long. But for whatever reason, I really like it with four because the map feels not so big. <laughs> I've seen a lot of playthroughs with only two, and it just always feels like they can't get to where they need to because it's just so hard to move. And I really enjoy the aspect of four, even though I only have three on the board. <laughs> What we'll do is we'll leave the lead investigator as Mandy, and we'll start with her next round. Norman, we're just skipping his turn, because he's right now lost in time and space. All right, let's start it off.